Hi, this is John Freeman coming to you from London Fishing Hour in Beirut. Um, this is about, I guess, in my mind, one of the best and sometimes, some days, only good things about the internet is the ability for us to be together apart um, while not doing damage to the, to the climate. But how much more I would rather be at a cafe or an art space or down on the Corniche in Beirut rather than here in lovely old rainy England. Um, I thought for this event I might read a brief passage from uh, Dictionary of the Undoing, which is my attempt to try to get, grapple with how, uh, how many forces in our life were pulling us apart as, as, a, as a society and how difficult it made us, made it for us to, to be in the same space even, to even conceive of that same space. And to me, one of the barriers for that has been the thing that says it's going to connect us, which is the internet and social media. So this is a, an absidarium, it runs together, essays um, dr driven from a letter, uh, so A is for agitate, B is for body, C is for citizen, and uh, I for me is for I. And this is how it goes. We hear a lot about ourselves on the internet. Our meals artfully presented, our last night in the town glamorously recorded, our daily thoughts attentively dictated. The internet is all about us. It's a surging, frothing current of first personness. Our reaction to news, our pets, and their funny habits. Our faces adorned with inspiring quotes. Our bodies after a diet, or before a diet, or in between, or just needing praise. We share a lot of these snippets of our lives. Way too many of them, in fact, especially the good news and the good photographs. Is it any wonder that some of the most popular technology in the world has ever made from the iPod to the iPhone, even if in their names, I was meant to stand for internet, begins with the letter I? That I has long since meant in everyday use, me. Long before it normalized a reality, TV, sociopathic present, social media normalized narcissism. On social media, it's considered normal to talk about yourself a lot of the time, to talk about yourself in the third person, to take pictures of yourself endlessly as if you were a celebrity and your own paparazzi at the same time. It's natural, even if you're a friend and not a friend of a person displaying such obvious need to like the photograph. Clearly, they're asking for some sort of regard. It's easy to give. But since so social media is driven by algorithms, it sees that like and send us, sends us more photos akin to it. Photos of people in states of fabulous repair, making us sitting wherever we are in sweats or less, think that perhaps we should smarten up a bit. Not long ago, before the invention of social media, it was common in some Western countries for people to spend more time with their computers than with their spouses. Now that is the case for people with their mobile phones, and what was once a communication device has become a kind of mirror. If your phone has social media downloaded onto it, and chances are that it does, you can parcel out moments of boredom to see how many likes your latest post has received, how many reactions your latest shared photograph is getting, how many times people you have never met have forwarded your latest pithy reaction to someone else's pithy reaction to a commented upon piece of news? The mirror is always there and it feeds us. Every time we look into it, we get a reward, a comment, a like, a reaction, and a tiny blip of dopamine pulses through our system. It's the same feedback loop a slot machine works on. Technology has always been a prosthetic, but think of the ways it's now driven by a powerful cognitive conditioning machine. Each loop teaches us to need more constant multi-channel feedback in regard. These tools are changing us, and it's worth asking, do we want to keep going down this road? And also, is the road even big enough? Everywhere one meanders on social media or the internet, there's a phalanx of eyes already there, saying what happened, digesting, and often criticizing who was there 
and reporting what they thought of it, causing one of the most common modern sensations of a heavily digitalized existence to be FOMO. Giving the tools and broadcast capabilities of journalists, a lot of a significant portion of heavy users of the internet are weaponizing their social lives and applying the tones of digital social life, glibness and a crystallized cult of personality worship which is born out of celebrity culture to politics and world events. Is it any wonder we're crippled by apathy? Apathy is the natural response to this tidal wave of agitating self-regard. Apathy is also hard to turn off once it's on. And it is not a subtle directional defense. It's difficult to draw up one's shield in like one corner and be wide open in another, especially when the rise of social media has eroded the very notion that we can all even fit on the same digital beach. We're also in love with the idea that we can control our own wave machine that we don't realize day by day that this new culture of narcissism is drawing tyranny closer and closer, even as our dependence upon it, the power it requires, the metals, the minerals our devices need, poisons our environment. We need to step away from time to time. The internet is not the world. It's a dream that distracts us, distracts us from the world itself. While the internet came into being, we slept through one burst of development after another. When we blinked our eyes and finally looked up, many of us wondered where our local bookshops had gone, our pubs, our post offices, our newspapers, our hardware stores, our coffee shops, our florists, Anything requiring the word our has ironically been put under threat by the greatest communication device ever created as it tipped toward the intense and endless empowerment of the word I. Why shop globally when you can shop for a bargain? Sorry, why shop locally when you can shop for a bargain globally? Why go to a park when you can stay in your own backyard? Why overnight in a friend's guest room? when you can rent a home from a stranger who is out of town? Why ride public transport when you can hitch a ride with an out-of-work actor? Why read the newspaper when you can follow the news feed on social media that has been carefully and selected and curated for you to show you exactly what you want from the world? The word often used to describe this interaction between our entitled digital self and the word, the world, is freedom. Of course, we are free to shop wherever we please, and who wouldn't patronize a global retail giant over a local store if everything there costs half as much? The so-called invisible hand of the market is in fact encouraging us as consumers to make that very choice. It says, you people here on the internet, you have won the competition for business, so you are free to reward companies as you see fit. Part of, the, part of the modern 21st century, you, the adorned, well-regarded you, is that you are the chief, you're the boss, you're the decider. Thousands of messages sent to us on the internet every day are telling us just that, begging at, saying, it's all about you, make the choice. In modern life, though, we all too often confuse freedom with liberty, the ability to act without constraint, with the ability to act without oppressive restrictions. They're not the same thing. Reasonable limits to our behavior is the definition of civil society. And if decency, fairness, and a tiny bit of generosity don't enter the picture, we begin to emulate in miniature fashion the tyrannies we would be so wise to avoid, thrusting ourselves forward as individuals when in fact, we would be much more powerful if we stepped forward as a we. It's not hard to rebuild that pronoun. Stepping away from the internet, if only for a short time, helps. Putting away the telephone while one does, that helps too. Not, everyone, not every moment has to be recorded to be valuable. What can be of value is experience itself. And that experience is based upon an interaction with another human being. Thinking twice before turning it into something fungible is a weird form of resistance. We is created through privacy as well as visibility. Through asserting the right to speak and form groups 
and have interactions that are not commodified, that are not a market. We know when we begin, begin polishing an experience for consumption. The kind of we that our societies needs to build ought not to be the kind that is for sale. It's a complicated we, a fractious we, a thoughtful we, a slow we, a we that moves at the speed of conversation, not product cycles, a we that is durable and decent, a we that looks outward and tries to invite people in rather than remind those who aren't there that they had missed out. The internet began as a defense tool. It was a fail-safe network for the US president and American nuclear scientists to use to communicate in the event of a catastrophic attack. How else would people talk if all the phone lines were down? How would a president get accurate information about cities if he couldn't hear from the people in them? Once it became clear that this was not as urgent a threat as American scientists had feared, they began to use that fledgling network to share computing power from the few supercomputers that were scattered all over the world. These machines were so big and expensive, only a few institutions could have them. A few years into the study of sharing, the group researched what the internet was being used for. Their findings were shocking. Here were these giant computers, huge as houses, with long wait times to perform key data crunching operations. Very few scientists were dialing into them remotely, though. And instead, it appeared they were using this powerful, defense-born tool to do one thing and one thing only, to chat and to send messages to each other. Perhaps that is where we must return to if we are ever going to rebuild our capacity to say the word we. Step back and remember what a miracle it is that we can do so in the first place. Thanks so much.